that was fighting for gay rights mm -hmm. and people were killed. No they were killed at Stonewall. Nobody was no killed. Rave. There's something about Raven. From her run on the franchise, the legacy she made with her makeup style, the method in which she handles her career, or the divide among drag race queens that either really like her or throw shade towards her. Along with that, in recent years, we've seen the fan base in itself evolve the way they perceive her, especially when we compare the first decade of drag race to the past couple of years. So, since a lot of you have been requesting this video for many months, let's get right into it. But before we start, Start. This video is sponsored by Manscaped. I was given the perfect package 4.0 that's currently available on their website. Manscaped is a company that offers you the highest quality and essentials to take proper care of your trimming needs, like the Lawn Mower 4.0 trimmer that helps reduce the risk of nicks, something that's a huge plus to your personal hygiene. Honestly, as someone with hairy balls, it's very hard to find the proper company to help tame the jungle. It's cordless and waterproof, so you can trim in the shower, which is very convenient because it doesn't leave a big mess afterwards. I also love that it has lights in the front, kind of like the lights on the main stage of Drag Race. Only this time, your body is the runway and the trimmer is the queen. Top it off, nobody likes to have smelly balls. That's why with the Crop Preserver, you can walk around knowing that your crotch area is smelling as fresh and clean as possible, along with the Crop Reviver, which adds cooling aloe vera to quickly refresh the area whenever you need it. The Perfect Package 4.0 also comes with a free shirt and underwear that you can wear when greeting your special someone at the door. So don't waste any time and use code GREENGAY for 20% off your entire order plus international free shipping and two free gifts. Remember, it's only for a limited time, so make sure to take advantage by clicking the link in the description. Now, let's begin. Raven is a controversial queen. There's a really fine line between people that either really love her personality along with her drag style, while on the other hand, there's many people that find her to be a bit of a strong personality that isn't the most personable or, I guess, appealing to most audiences. I myself am not sure where I I stand with her. She's pretty much the only queen that came out of Drag Race only to end up right back in its production, only this time working as part of the staff, or in her case as Rue's makeup artist. Yet unlike the majority of Drag Race queens, it's seemingly very hard to obtain Raven when it comes to interviews or any of her takes on big topics. While she used to be very prevalent in terms of her participation in shows like Hey Queen, after getting hired by World of Wonder, she became a figure that we only really see making cameos on episodes. With even the few times that she's done interviews recently tends to be very specific in terms of talking about new projects like Painted with Raven. Maybe it's that same tactic to stay silent that has allowed her to have such a long-standing career. I mean, as we know, a job that involves you working so close with RuPaul doesn't always have the longest lifespan, with situations like Matthew Anderson's departure or Delta Works soft firing. And while I won't go into that whole debacle again, mostly because I already have this video that covers it, what I will say is that something that always caught my attention was how Delta Works said that shortly after her and Raven were hired to do Rue's hair and makeup respectively on season 9, that Raven told her early on, quote, we are not a package, which symbolized that Raven did not care about anyone else there but herself, her career, and her legacy, which she has every right to do, because one's career should always come first before anyone else. Maybe she saw the writing on the wall in terms of Delta's strong personality, but it's also pretty indicative of Raven's own personality as well which is one that is determined on their own success. That aspect of her reminds me a little bit of Trixie Mattel, in the sense that Trixie has managed her career by never engaging in any online drama. Whether it be responding to things that fans have called her out on, or other queens from the franchise that have said things about her behind the scenes behavior, you can always bet that Trixie will most likely stay quiet on 90% of negative reactions that may happen surrounding her presence in the drag race world. And that's exactly something that Raven does too. The only difference is that Trixie's actually always seen posting on social media, while Raven not only doesn't engage in the negativity, but she also barely ever posts anything online, or gives any commentary regarding any issues. Although despite being sort of an untouchable or unreachable figure, Raven's beginning in her drag journey was similar to most queens. It started way before Drag Race was ever a thing. She was just at a gay bar watching the local queens perform, and got a feeling in herself that it was something she would like to do one day too. Back then, the 
resources that baby drag queens have now did not exist. Like there wasn't YouTube tutorials to learn how to do drag makeup or easy ways to find good wigs that you could learn to style. Even the few things that were available were scarce. For example, you couldn't find tights in a bunch of different colors or cosmetics and even costumes. Essentially, you had to be very self-sufficient and be able to utilize what was within your radius, which is why she didn't just dive right into drag. At first, she began as a backup dancer for established queens, until eventually, the straw that broke the camel's back was when she saw Chad Michaels perform as Celine Dion for one of her shows. But 20 minutes later, she came out as Cher, and another 20 minutes later, she came out as Marilyn Manson. And so, finally, Raven decided that she would start her journey through drag. She officially started in 2002 by entering a friend's amateur show just to do it once, but ended up winning and realized she had so much fun conceptualizing a performance that she decided to do it a few more times. According to Raven, when you get in drag, there's a part of you that comes out to reveal a lot of your true identity. Specifically, she understands that a big part of her personality in drag is to a degree sort of like a diva. Even the way she walks will have a certain poise, and so she'd end up experimenting with all different types of drag, from being a gothic princess to a glamazon kitty girl, until eventually finding an aesthetic that she felt comfortable to build on. Of course, as I mentioned before, Raven became a drag queen long before season 1 of RuPaul's Drag Race even happened. So then, once it became clear that Drag Race was going to be a thing, what was her reaction? Well, after season 1 aired, Drag Race was sort of the big talk among the drag community. Mayhem Miller said that Raven and Morgan would say that they had no interest on being on Drag Race, so they weren't even going to bother auditioning to be on it. Something that made Mayhem herself not interested in auditioning either. But little did she know that Raven and Morgan secretly did audition and would end up getting on the show together. Mayhem would only find out after Morgan said she'd be gone for a while. And then Raven ended up saying the same thing. So Mayhem came to the realization that Raven was going to be on season 2, along with Morgan. When Raven competed on season 2, it was really difficult for her to be able to go outside of her box that she had created for herself within the drag scene. Working at nightclubs every weekend is not the same as being on TV and having to do a bunch of diverse challenges. Yet she was impressed, along with most of the cast, at the step up in the production that was done from season 1 to season 2. The sets were suddenly a lot larger, more detailed, with the production of the main stage that would essentially be what the show would end up honing in on in the years to come. She managed to survive episode 1's design challenge. But by episode 2, she didn't do too good in the challenge to create a dance routine around a stripper pole, resulting in her group losing the challenge, and for the first time, she placed in the bottom two alongside Nicole Page Brooks. And they were both coincidentally wearing sort of similar outfits. They lip sync to My Lovin', You're Never Gonna Get It by En Vogue. And Raven sort of won the performance when at one point she began pointing at each of the queens in the back to the lyrics, Never Gonna Get It. Which I mean is sort of a really awesome moment, and showed that she was very skilled when it came to interpreting a lip sync song. In fact, she was so good at interpreting lip sync songs that on episode 3, she landed in the bottom 2 again, after not doing good on the acting challenge. This time, she was in the bottom 2 with Mystique Summers Madison, and lip sync to I Hear You Knocking by Wynonna Judd, and she did a decent job performing again, earning another lip sync win. For the next 3 episodes, she would survive in the competition, until episode 7 where she won her first challenge, that involved them brand by doing an interview and advertising a book and vodka flavor. And by episode 8, she won her second challenge for the makeover. Which, re-watching this episode only reminded me about how far we've come in terms of the quality that we expect from makeovers on the show. Looking back, Raven admits that she now understands that success in a competition setting comes from people who are able to mold themselves into what is being expected from them, rather than those who opposed going with the flow. It held her back from finding joy in her run, as she was constantly fighting an uphill battle. But she did make it all the way to the end, becoming a runner-up. So then, when we get to the season 2 finale, we're after lip-syncing to Jealous of My Boogie, with Tyra delivering an extremely flawless performance that exuded such an X-factor, RuPaul said that Tyra Sanchez was the winner of the season, leading to Tyra hyperventilating on the stage, Raven being disappointed, and the audience getting some good TV. Raven actually said in an interview that she thought Tyra was faking her hyperventilation, and that she thinks that Tyra knew she was going to win the season 
season. So because of that, she felt she needed to overreact to the announcement of her win since she knew what the outcome was going to be. After Raven lost, she was sent to the workroom to do the elimination process, where she'd have to write a mirror message. When Raven wrote, quote, keep your eyes on the stars, you'll never be one on the mirror, not only was it sort of an invite for her fans to discredit Tyra's win, but it also validated the hatred that she was already receiving during the season. Yet, we'd end up finding out that that line was actually something that she used to always say at the end of her shows. But at the same time, it was a little bit of a jab due to losing the crown. Yet according to her, it shouldn't have mattered if it was shady because it made for good TV. Subsequently, this sense of, in a way, animosity for losing the crown to Tyra seemed to continue even months after filming had been finished. In interviews shortly after the finale aired, Raven proceeded to state that there wasn't any bad blood between her and Tyra, and that she was really just trying to process her loss, and was pissed for coming so far and losing. She also did another interview after the airing of the season 2 reunion that something that helped her get over losing the crown was being able to tell herself that she was still indeed a winner, with quote, we all made it here out of thousands of submissions, we all won in our own right. Yet even though that statement could have been nice, she goes on to ruin it with quote, I mean, who won the last American Idol? Everyone remembers Adam Lambert, but they do not remember the winner. Which again felt to many like a jab towards the real winner of season 2, Tyra Sanchez. What sometimes feels like a really disappointing part of Drag Race history is the way that Raven seemed to at times discredit James Ross, or in this case Tyra Sanchez. Look, when I made my Tyra video, it was long before James even made his initial comeback. I had a lot of hopes for James and I still do, but regardless of the way he handled his new introduction into the spotlight, it doesn't change a lot that happened in his legacy as a winner. We all know now that Raven didn't deserve to win season 2 because she did poorly throughout the season compared to James. She also had a very rough personality, yet if we're being fair, most of the queens on that season had a sort of standoffish type of personality. Seeing the way that James managed her return after her recent comeback to drag was a little disappointing, but I like to remember her for what her drag race journey was. Some bridges are burned down forever, with no chance of rebuilding, and that's okay. You have to protect your peace first at all times. But Back to Raven, I guess looking back at these earlier comments, we can acknowledge that season 2, which aired in 2011, was a different time. The show wasn't anywhere near as big as right now. And while there was toxic fans, it felt like they didn't have much of a voice as they do now. Essentially, Raven seemed to be very unfiltered on season 2. She said very early on this season that she wasn't there to make friends. She was there to show off her talents and get the crown. Many of her confessionals tended to be, in a way, television gold, especially when it came to reading other queens. Although it's moments like that that by the end of the season would boil in a lot of queens sort of confronting her in their reunion about her behavior. Such as Nicole Page Brooks who in the competition seemed to have developed a friendship with Raven. But by the time she went home, we learn in Untucked that Raven didn't like the fact that Nicole seemed to have a small crush on her and wasn't too keen about her drag aesthetic either. Yet one of her biggest rivalries was with Tatiana, since Tatiana was the new queen on the scene. But Tatiana also had a bunch of comments confidence and stood her ground whenever she felt disrespected, while Raven let out her frustrations in the confessionals. Raven was mostly upset towards Tatiana because she saw so many people putting so much effort into their transformation, but with Tatiana, she was quote, seeing the judges living for something that wasn't polished. Even though she did think Tatiana was beautiful, she didn't think that she was at the level of the other contestants at that point in time. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if we lived in a universe where Raven did win. Would her ego had escalated to unmeasurable? amounts? Would her career have skyrocketed in a brand new way? Or would the fans have turned on her by instead saying that James aka Tyra should have won given that she had never landed in the bottom two, along with having the best track record? We would have also potentially seen Tyra come back to All Stars 1. But again, this is all speculation, so there's not really a point in thinking about it. But it is interesting. Anyways, one could argue that despite Raven never winning Drag Race, she still won at life. She'd go on to get a lot of support from World of Wonder in the years to come. She was pretty much a fan favorite. I think that Raven acting like a mean girl on Drag Race is completely fine. I find it to be very entertaining, just like it was when Tyra or anyone else was being that way. I mean, Raja is one of the main fan favorites of the franchise, largely because of her amazing fashion sense. But if you rewatch season 3, she was actually quite brutal when it came to her reads against the other queens, which is sort of the beauty of the earlier seasons, because we all love some good drama. Yet despite all this, Raven didn't really have any obstacles after her season 2 run. Her biggest stain on her journey was 
just the fact that she was a runner-up twice, which isn't the worst thing in the world. She'd also get to do side projects like the first season of Drag U, which was filmed when season two was still airing. It's during the filming of Drag U that she was upset because she read a blog that said some negative things about her, which RuPaul noticed. And so Ru took her aside and told Raven to never read things about herself online because it can send you down a rabbit hole that just makes you feel terrible about yourself. Eventually, Raven told her mother and close friends to never read things about her online either because it's an area of negativity that she never wants to pay attention to in order to maintain her own peace. It's this slow evolution that eventually led to Raven being credited as having been a big influence over the ways that other queens did their makeup in the beginning years of RuPaul's Drag Race. When she was introduced on season 2, she would end up jumpstarting a trend of queens doing similar faces as hers, which we see especially in modern times with queens like Crystal Versace, and her eventually incorporating some of her own aesthetic onto RuPaul. Others have argued that she wasn't the queen who invented that specific style of makeup, but whether or not she invented that style of doing your mug is up to interpretation. One thing that's for sure is that she definitely did popularize it. Sort of like Trixie, who popularized that own style of makeup, but she herself is credited in the Affaira for inspiring her to want to try more extravagant types of makeup. All of these accolades eventually built up to a large fan base for Raven in the short two years between the filming of season two and the filming of All Stars 1. All Stars 1 was a rough spot, but at least the footage we have from the season is sort of like a time capsule of the original drag icons from the earlier years. It goes without saying that it had one of the best all-star casts ever, with the worst format ever. And while there is some people that like to say they enjoy the team's format, it seems really hard to believe that anyone would seriously say that they enjoy this format. I remember when I first watched All-Stars 1, what bothered me the most wasn't just that we had two queens leaving each season. It was that challenges really made no sense to me, like, at all. At times, I was like, what exactly are they judging the girls on? To top it off, I always forget about the twist to have the pairs in the bottom two, having the queen in the bottom two who sat out get the option to press a button that would make them substitute their partner in the lip sync if they felt they needed the help to outperform their competitor. Not only was Yara Sophia the only one to utilize this option to replace Alexis in the lip sync against Raven, but it also resulted in them both losing anyway. When it came to Raven's runways on this season, I did very much enjoy them, a lot more than what we saw from season two. But again, she wouldn't flourish in most of the challenges, and her team landed in the bottom three times in a row on a six episode season. While it's also been debated whether Raven outperformed Chad Michaels in that final lip sync, I will forever be a fan of Chad's squat and point. Now, now squat, squat and point. In a way, we're kind of lucky that we have All Stars 1, because there's absolutely no way, at least in my opinion, that even if Rue had somebody else do his makeup, that Raven would ever want to compete on an All Star season again. It just wouldn't make sense. Her position as a long standing makeup artist for Rue puts her at a level of prestige that many queens would wish they had. Along with that, I do think that Raven will most likely have her biggest resurgence after Rue steps down from the production, because I can definitely see her releasing either a book about her years doing RuPaul's makeup, or doing a tell-all interview with many different outlets about the countless behind-the-scenes stories she must have. Yet, then again, it's important to note that before getting her gig as RuPaul's personal makeup artist, Raven was, to a degree, more involved with voicing her opinions. The last drama that Raven got into shortly before getting hired at World of Wonder was after Bob the Drag Queen had won season 8. She had posted a Facebook status that read, F your purse, which was pretty clear to most fans at least that it meant she was unhappy about Bob's win. Someone that was also bothered by this was Bob the Drag Queen, but on her podcast years later expressed that it sort of left a bad taste in her mouth and it wasn't until she was forced to work alongside Raven during a couple fashion photo review episodes that she ended up not minding Raven all that much anymore. Yet during that time period of people calling out Raven for throwing shade at Bob, she would end up releasing a video that addressed the drama. In it, she references how on season 8, Bob once said in regards to Derek Barry, you could tell Derek, I don't like your dress, and she hears, I don't like you. Something that she attributes to everyone who read her post and came out of it thinking she didn't like Bob. She clarifies that she was not Team Bob, and didn't think she would win the title. This apology was always so funny because it was, in a way, sort of out of nowhere. But she'd go on to mention the hate the queens like Jeremy Carey or Jasmine Masters got on their seasons because of the rapid fan base. She does actually end up addressing Tyra Sanchez, of having to deal with a lot of negativity from the fans too, which is one of the few times that she'd ever publicly defended Tyra 
in any way, at least to my recollection. She does bring up a good point, which is that the fanbase has a narrative to place a responsibility onto queens like Tyra to tell them how they should behave. So when they aren't acting like saints, they then get called out by a bunch of random people online. It was actually sort of right of her to say this, and I agree completely, which makes me wish that I had seen that energy from her more over the years. Finally, she highlights the hypocrisy of fans by saying how during the airing of season 8, fans sent a bunch of hate to Acid Betty for being the villain of the season. Only for the moment after Acid was eliminated, fans began to complain that they had eliminated a front runner and that she was deserving of staying in the competition a lot longer. A couple months later, she'd end up doing an interview on Hate Queen, at one point addressing the Bob the Drag Queen drama again, saying that she feels that people that live their lives online are like goldfish, because her original F your purse against Bob was something that she actually had done in the past before, pointing out that when Jinx Monsoon won, she posted F this duck on social media. And when Chad Michaels won, she posted a picture of Katniss Everdeen and said that she never wanted to hear the words Hunger Games ever again. She feels that people tend to be getting offended for something that has nothing to do with them. Although, what is perhaps the most comical about this legacy of the F your purse fiasco is that Thorgy Thor performed the remix of Raven's Apology while drugged up on a wheelchair. <laughs> I don't fucking know why. I want to talk once. I should use a person. I just want to team up. I don't fucking know why. I want to talk once. <laughs> when it comes to the topic of fans, it's sort of like an endless cycle that is hard to really find a solution for. Fans to this day are horrible. I mean, recently I made a tweet about Britta Filter talking about how she got a lot of hate on her season, and somehow there was so many people that find ways of trying to argue why it was valid for people to come for her. I mean, it's okay to not like a queen, to even hate her when she appears on screen even, but to act like it's now your god-given right to go online and spread disgusting messages about them the whole reason why it's ruined the fun of a lot of the fans and the queens themselves who can't be themselves anymore. Remember when people got on Valentina on season 9 for not saying anything to her fanbase for the hate they were sending to queens like Nina, Alexis, or Aja? It would have been a meaningful moment to have, but really, would it have even mattered? The topic of fans has also been discussed by Raja as well. One of Raven's closest friends has been Raja for a good while. It's clear that Raja has a lot of admiration for Raven, as she has praised her many times over the past decade. It's sort of crazy how at one point fashion photo review was like the epitome of Drag Race fashion takes. Everyone would wait for Raja and Raven's take on a look, and most of the time they tended to agree with the general fan base. Although at times it tended to ruffle people's feathers, like when they booted Kim Chi's book ball look, yet tooted Derek's creation. It was also one of the early hit shows from the WoW Presents channel. And a fun fact is that when they used to review the current airing seasons, they would be shown pictures of the outfits, but with the face of each contestant blurred out so that they wouldn't show show any favoritism. Yet after fans were calling this out due to a big aspect of a look being the makeup style that a queen does, they decided about halfway through the season 8 fashion photo review to finally show the uncensored version to Raja and Raven. Nowadays, fashion photo review has a lot more competitors, so it's lost a lot of its impact or value. But we all know you as bootleg review show is the better version anyway, so… When we go into the world of Rue Girls, I think it's very fair to say that there's some really mixed reactions to Raven. Some of the queens don't don't really care about her. Others have called her out multiple times, accusing her of colorism. And then there's the ones that actually like Raven so much that they'd like to see her one day take over as the host of Drag Race. When it comes to blackfishing, over the years, many fans have called out Raven for seemingly having a darker complexion every time she's seen on camera, with some feeling that her obsession with tanning or the need to use darker foundations is problematic. We even had queens from the show call her out on it, such as James Ross, or very recently being Dahlia Sin who went somewhat viral when she compared Raven's skin color on a recent cameo with RuPaul, only for Raven's to be slightly darker than Ru's skin. Some fans have theorized that maybe Raven just uses all of the free foundation that Ru gets from PR packages on herself, while others have said that maybe all of her time living in the UK has resulted in her getting more into tanning, since I guess it must be popular over there. But let me know what your thoughts are regarding this topic in the comment section. In regards to Raven taking over as host, 
it's sort of a mixed top. I mean, we've had Bob the Drag Queen say many times that she personally feels that the show is sort of grooming Raven to adjust to that role, with the eventual future being for her to be the face of the franchise. Even Naomi Smalls has expressed how much she'd love to see this happen. But I don't think Raven would ever be able to take over RuPaul's position because she lacks having any endearing personality. You want someone that attracts viewers and has a friendly vibe to them. Raven doesn't really have that, at least in regards to the short run throughs that she's done on the show in recent years. She can sure deliver some one-liners, but it's not enough to carry the brand. I do see her, however, being a side judge to whichever queen inevitably takes on the main position of host, because she can give some good critiques in terms of makeup and fashion. But again, a big part of Rue's demeanor as host is her sense of comedy along with charisma, which Raven seems to lack. Yet for the first time in the franchise's history, on Drag Race UK Season 4, for one of the episodes, Rue was not able to film. So Michelle stepped in to host the episode, and Raven stepped in to take Michelle's place. Sort of a future of what could potentially be a reality when RuPaul stops hosting the franchise entirely. Going into filming this episode, Raven was very nervous about it, since it was the first time that in a RuPaul hosted season, a previous alumni from the show was going to be in the judges panel. Yet after it was all said and done, she felt more comfortable with it and actually can't wait to potentially be on the judges panel again. We can see how Raven has slowly evolved her style of being a host with the introduction of her show, Painted with Raven. A reality competition show based on contestants that are given challenges to do makeup styles every episode, resulting in one or more of them going home every week. This was a WoW Presents show that was made through social distancing guidelines throughout the pandemic. The first winner of Painted with Raven, whose drag name is Crimson, was actually able to create a decent following for themselves after the season was done. I'm not sure how much of it was due to being on Painted with Raven since I have yet to meet someone that's actually watched it, but I'm really happy to see someone find success from it. The show would end up getting renewed for season 2 with Raven saying that RuPaul gave her some personal advice before filming on how to handle the eliminations on each episode, adding that she was told that you have to try to disconnect yourself from the emotional ties that you have with each contestant, because you're going to want all of them to win, you're going to want all of them to be in the top, and you're going to want all of them to do well. So you need to understand that when it comes down to it, someone has to be in the bottom and someone has to be in the top. Ru actually provided her with a lot of advice when it came to hosting her own show, including to just be yourself and understand understand that each contestant are worthy of being there, and each of them are gonna have certain feelings over the decisions that are made, but not to take it to heart. I really do wonder what Rue and Raven are like behind the scenes, because this series of advice she gave her to some may sound like just a bunch of words and no authenticity, but I do think that Rue enjoys what she does, and finds a nice connection with some of the queens that compete on the show, despite the fact that there's so many seasons being filmed a year. As I was doing research for this video, I came across a performance of Raven when she was working at Dream Girls, and there was this person in the audience that was just drunk out of their mind and yelling from how much she's living for the queens, at one point interrupting Raven when she was trying to announce some of the upcoming performers. Inevitably, Raven ended up getting super annoyed and proceeded to read her to filth. <laughs> Honestly, there's not really a reason why I showed you this other than I found it kind of funny and we're almost at the end of this video. Essentially, the story of Raven is pretty amazing when you think about it. Queens from the first two seasons of the show don't get a lot of love unless they've been on some of the more recent modern all-stars. Raven has managed to maintain a legacy even though she's now behind the scenes painting RuPaul's face and barely connects with the audience online. She herself has said, quote, I went from being a stifled kid growing up in the desert thinking that this was going to be the rest of my life.
my life. Until I got to my early 20s and realized there was a whole world out there. I've become the makeup artist for the number one drag queen in the world and competed on her show. I've been giving my own show now and I've also been given my own show now too. In her future, she would like to collaborate with a major brand one day to come out with her own makeup line. Before we end this video, I wanted to ask a question. We know that fame can be difficult, but do you think that the queens have competed on the show and found their success because of it, owe it to people to give them an explanation for their behavior since they owe them their career? Or do they not owe anybody anything? Let me know your thoughts. I want to thank Manscaped again for sponsoring this video. Please use code GREENGAY for 20% off your order and clicking the link below. I want to take a moment to thank my patrons. In the Elite Pink Squad, we have Matthew Burns, Gay Uncle, Wendell Norris Realtor, Tyler Hendricks MD, Poppers Alberta, and Sari Tish. In the Gay Squad, we have Ethan Von Queer and Emma Malander. And in the Green Squad, we have Azure, Cayman Rider Furry, Franny Fishsticks, Edgar Allan Pub, O Nicole, The Only Sean, LP, and Soy Pablete. If you'd like to see your name on the screen, you can support me on Patreon. The link will be in the description. Alright guys, well, this month is gearing up to be my most productive month of the year in terms of the amount of videos I've released. I said in my last video that I had quit smoking weed and I'm now over one month sober from it. So that's why I've been spending my time just focusing on making content. I'm also kind of experimenting with the type of videos that I make. I feel like before I focused more on creating nothing but quality over quantity that at times held me back from releasing anything in weeks. And looking back, maybe that's affected my ability to grow my channel. But now that I've sort of found a happy medium between what I consider to be quality and also putting out content that I feel is entertaining, I'm enjoying it a lot more. And I'm going back to the main reason why I started this channel in the first place. Anyway, if you've listened to the very end of this video, thanks for listening to my little speech. We just hit 69, we just hit 69,000 subscribers and we're almost at 70k. So let's make sure we hit that before the month ends. But to help me do that, make sure to like this video, comment down below, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you guys next time.